Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, I, uh, I missed the chance to do that introduction tonight, honestly, would have been Sinner Saved by Grace. <laughs> but that would be the, the best way to introduce, uh, that would be me. Um, Are we good? I'm not to, to cause any trouble up here. All right, so I'm going to leave this on, um, and uh, some reasons for that, but uh, uh, here's a fun story actually around the fact that I do not have glasses on. This is like the fourth time I've worn contact lenses in my life. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> My life of 25 years last Wednesday, 25 years So she said, you know, we logged a lot of hours in the same space in the last year and a half, right? And she's seen this face, <laughs> just a little too much of my face. And so she, you know, she's awesome by the way, and so don't take this the wrong way, but she's like, dude, she didn't say dude, she said, no, please do something. Something for your, you know, just the, the glasses she thought maybe looked really old. And, and, oh, I just, okay, I'll, I'll get some contact lenses, but it's tough to teach an old dog new tricks, right? So I, I, I just haven't really taken, you know, I can't put them in, I can't get them out, you know, it just takes too long. And so, but tonight, to avoid the foggage, I am wearing contacts, and this is okay. So, and, and look at how good I look. You look good. <laughs> Okay, um, the other thing that, that this actually highlights is my single superpower. I have a superpower. What? I do, yeah. So watch carefully. Uh, <laughs> I can wiggle my ears. Thank you very much. Yes. Can anybody else wiggle their ears? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I thought I was the only one. Um, very good. <laughs> Well, these are um, these are <laughs> actually really wanted to get to know you better, and not necessarily that way. Um, I'm going to take just a little bit. Uh, we've been apart for so long that there, there really are. I can't wait to actually get to know many of you better. I know some of you decently, uh, but I would love to get um, to know many of you better. I want to just introduce quickly my family. I mentioned my wife; she's awesome. She is. Uh, mother of Luke and Jonathan, there they are. Um, two boys, here's a quick story that I'm gonna start high and I'm gonna end high, right? We're gonna, we're gonna look at some tough subject here in a moment, but we're gonna start high. This is, this is as high as it gets. Uh, Luke is first born down below. Uh, he just turned 22. Uh, Luke was born with a myriad of issues. Uh, we discovered in utero that there's just a lot wrong. Um, so brain issues and, and literally a dozen specialists over the years. For any of you pre-meds, by the way, this is a very sincere invitation. I would love to meet with any of y'all want to talk about what it's like to be a family on the receiving end of a lot of actually amazing medical care. But uh, we've walked some miles in hospital spaces and Luke is awesome. Um, here's a, a quick thing to, here's what really sets him apart. Luke is unable, he's in some ways tower level, right? So he's unable to really process and, and engage in the world that, that we take, in a way that we take for granted. He, his, he, his world is, is pretty small, right? And he operates in a, in, in a very kind of basic ways. Uh, and that's, he does the best that he can. A cool thing, when he was seven, he just started walking because he wanted to. That was actually more on miraculous on kind of crippled feet, but he's a determined young guy and he is awesome. But here's, here's in related to the topic tonight. Luke does not have a developed kind of uh, dark side. <laughs> um, Luke had, was, is born, we're going to talk in a moment about original sin. So there's a little bit of mischievous kind of fun you know, push back that, that he gives us some time to time. And he, he actually smiles and he just gets this look at his face. That's as, as far as it goes. But here's what Luke does really well. He loves people so well in this kind of pure hearted way. He's completely uninhibited. Um, he's very comfortable in his own skin. 
and he loves like nobody else. He exhibits, I, I'm not exaggerating an ounce. He exhibits the fruits of the Spirit in a way that I barely touch. So that's Luke. Uh, his other brother, uh, uh, his brother Jonathan is uh, a sophomore. Um, Jonathan is also awesome. Um, he's, Jonathan is like you. So here's the here's a little takeaway of what as I introduce these two boys. Like, Lord, why did you give me two boys that are on the opposite ends of the spectrum in ability of abilities and gifts? Opposite ends. Like they cannot be further apart in terms of what they do or cannot do, right? Here's here's the, the great news. By God's grace, I'm a decent dad. Okay? And, and that is because God is just so working. I love Jonathan and Luke just the same. Like there is no difference, none whatsoever in how much I love them. Why? Because they belong to me and my sons. It has nothing, my love has nothing to do with what they can or cannot do. Mm-hmm. It's a glorious kind of thing. I, I remember that the first time that was sinking in because I'm kind of performance driven and I'm, you know, it's sometimes never good enough and just all of that. I'm like, Wait a minute, does God look at me and just kind of love me just because? And it's like, yeah, he does. And, and do I have expectations for Jonathan that I do not have for Luke? Absolutely. It would be a shame if Jonathan wasted the gifts that God gave him. So do you see how that works? But, but we're going to start with this fact. The scriptures tell us that God loves the human race. And that's why he tells us the truth about our condition, and he invites us to do something about it. So anyway, enough of the um, the family side. Um, so because um, of the nature of the talk, I want to make one more stop in my quick uh, preface here. Um, many of you are familiar with the story of the woman caught in adultery, right? Uh, caught in the act of adultery, brought to Jesus, by some kind of riled up Pharisees and scribes who were what? Who were intent on finding, building a case against Jesus because they wanted to to do away with him, literally. And and so uh, they they bring this woman, and and imagine, first of all, if you're one of the the Pharisees and scribes, you hope that there was still some semblance of conscience left where they felt some pity for this woman brought out in public who was about to be stoned right to death and brought before Jesus. This is a public spectacle, okay? It's one thing for us to do something that almost everybody agrees is wrong, but then to be caught and brought out in public in front of people about to meet your death. You can only imagine what she was thinking as she was staring um, up at at Jesus, who who was kind of silent for a while and annoyed the the Pharisees and like, say something, do something. What are you going to do, Jesus? She, the law of Moses says that she should be stoned, right? And you all know that the story is it's awesome. Jesus kind of stoops down, scribbles in the sand a little bit, stands up and says, he is without sin, cast the first stone. And it says, the text says, that they began to leave one by one, stone drop, leave one by one, starting with the oldest. And then Jesus pronounces amazing kind of, you know, where are your accusers? Um, they're gone. Is anyone condemning you? And she said, no, nobody is condemning me. And said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. The reason I mention that story right off the bat is that I'm one of those old guys that would quickly drop a stone and walk away. Because the, the I have logged a lot of miles in this life. And I want to assure you as I share and talk about this topic that I am, I am not climbing up on any platform whatsoever. Um, I have no right in in any regard, way, shape, or form to judge anybody because I am aware, fully aware, keenly aware uh, of my own sin over time and the way that God has forgiven me for much. And that's in part why I love much. I love God much because He has forgiven me much. So when we talk about this, please understand where I'm coming from. First of all, I have a responsibility to handle the text well, right? So we're going to look, it's kind of a flyover, I'm sorry for that, but for time's sake, we're going to touch on some passages and, and, and look at them and, 
and, and I'm responsible, right, for, for accurately mining some truths out of those passages. Secondly, though, I'm approaching this as a pastor because that's who I am. And here's what I know. Is it, and, and thankful for the worship and, and, and prayers, it's like inviting God into this space. God is in this space. And you know what that means? When the Holy Spirit is working in a space, and when we're looking at the Word of God, then we're going to hear from God, right? We're going to hear from God, and here's what some of y'all are going to hear as we look at passages. You're going to, some things are going to be brought to your mind where you're going to feel pretty crappy about, so as you remember, maybe some things that you have done. It, it might, there might be just some, like, oh my goodness, and, and those kind of moments where you feel some conviction by right, the Holy Spirit. Remember, if you experience some conviction tonight, that God convicts us, not because he's out to condemn us, but because he wants us to see what we need to see. So that might be going on a little bit. Here's what else might happen. Some of you all, this might conjure up a little bit, some memories, right, of the past where you have been wounded and hurt by somebody. There's some things that have gone on in your lifetime that you wish had not gone on in your lifetime, and they damaged you, right, and they're scarred. And you might not have really fully worked through those things, right? Let me encourage you that there, there's... There's restoration and healing. We're going to touch on that briefly. Um, I get that this topic is not a happy topic, right? And it might land in different ways for us. So um, I uh, am committed to uh, proceeding accordingly. Um, Paul, could you forward us to? We're going to do this. We're going to start by reading a couple passages. I'm going to highlight some things. And, and then I'm going to just reflect on the passages in, in like a second part. And then we'll finish with a, a look at the gospel again. Here we go, Mark 7. And Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you? not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. We don't have time to unpack original sin, but I think many of you are aware that in Genesis 3, that the fall of man happens in the garden. Adam and Eve chose poorly. Um, Adam, representing the human race now, uh, expelled from the garden, cursed the human race with this disposition, this bent, born separated, Enemies, even the scriptures say, from God, had odds with, enmity with God. And that is the, the curse that Jesus came to break, that he's called the second Adam, who came to take the sins of the world on himself and represent us in the judgment day and, and declare us clean and holy for all who believe, right? So there's, but that doctrine uh, deserves to be unpacked further. And at the end of this time, we're actually. I'm going to send on the, the list of the top of the resources, okay? If you want to dig deeper and, and, and look at some things, that's what we'll do. Let's go to the next slide. But it's, yes, from the heart of man, these things are, are coming from our hearts. Next slide. All right, and this is Paul. Um, Paul, of course, if you're familiar with Romans, breaks down the gospel in a wonderful way. It starts kind of ugly, and then it gets... It's a little rough, and then it gets good, and, and off he goes. But, but in the ugly beginning, he says there are two reasons that every human being on the planet is without excuse before God. Okay, let's start here. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, this is the first. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now what Paul captures in this first portion, this first reason that every man is without excuse is he says that all of us are born and, and when we are able, most of us are able to engage in the world and, and be thoughtful and we can see that there's a creator in creation. It's called general revelation. Everyone can see. It takes, I believe, deep conviction now, a, a level of denial and moving, a decisive moving away from God to deny that there's a creator when you look at pre the created order. That's what Paul is saying. That's what he's arguing. Um, they did not see fit to know God. And there's, we can see the give and take. God will allow us to make those small decisions along the way. And sometimes they're medium sized and sometimes they're really big decisions. They have a moral dimension, right? We are all on a track in, in one direction or another. We're, we're either moving away from God. This is the thing about our spiritual lives. It's not a static thing. It's a fluid thing. And we're, we're making decisions, we're moving in a direction, one or another. And God says that if we allow or kind of choose to, to resist, to reject, to deny, then, then make those decisions accordingly and, and live accordingly, that he will give us over or he will allow us to go in our hearts. Hearts again, right? will grow hard. So have you ever met someone that you could just tell by the demeanor and the, the expression that they had a hard heart? After a while, you live long enough, you begin to see and discern these things. You can see it on a person's face. And it's heartbreaking, right, to see a, a hard-hearted person. Next, the second reason we're going to get to the bullet. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, the second reason I'll... I'll Get to now before we look at, at Romans 3. The second reason is that um, whenever we judge another person, uh, we condemn ourselves. Why? Because we do the very same thing. That's the second reason that God says everyone is without excuse. We are making moral pronouncements and judgments all the time. It just kind of flows from us, and it's hard. We don't even see that we're doing it so much. I will never, ever forget as a young man, I was in Madison, and I uh, was rear ended. Um, was not my fault. The guy caught, caught me pretty good and, and got out. And he happened to be uh, working at a local car dealer. He gave me a car. He said, come by. We'll, we'll take care of this. I did not call the police, whatever. I just thought I trusted the guy. Um, went to the shop. And sure enough, he denied ever seeing me or, or knowing me. And, and in that moment, two things were going on that, that were both added up to being pretty pissed off. <laughs> One was... There was the injustice in the moment, right? Of like, no, you damaged my car, you're responsible, um, but you're denying your responsibility. But the second thing was, I was really, I think even more angry that I had been duped. I was so mad that I had kind of not, you know, felt at least trusted the guy. I was angry at myself as well for being so gullible as to be duped like that. And then you know what happened that afternoon? This happened in the morning on my way to, to the campus. That afternoon, God brought to mind another incident when I was a younger driver, like 17, 16. I, I grew up in the Midwest, and it was the thing back then. You just, I bought, saved up, bought a car right away, and I was touring around our little town all the time at age 16, 17. Another thing of feature in the Midwest is the sun sets really low in the sky. There's nothing to block the sun, right? There's no mountains or the top of the trees either. It's the plain states. And so the sun goes low, right? And so I'm driving to some, I don't know, somewhere, one of those little strip malls, and I, I aim for a parking space. The sun is in my face, and I plowed into a car that was parked there already. I did not see the car, right? And guess what I did in one and a half seconds? <laughs> this is not funny. I determined in one and a half seconds that I was out of there. And that I was not going to stick around for this. 
Um, I didn't want that on my record, and so I just backed up quickly and just went home. And on the way home, I remember feeling kind of guilty about that. But then I blocked it out of my mind, like literally. And I, I don't think I thought much about it until I had been rewriting the same thing happened to me. What's the point, right? It's like, careful, <laughs> careful, Don, when you judge and, and call someone out on something. Why? Because you are probably sooner or later going to do the same thing. And, and when this truth, as Jesus said it, Paul said it, um, when that really sunk in, I began to, to live and operate accordingly. That kept, that really slowed down my, my tendency to judge people. <laughs> because I was like, holy crap. I have violated God's law in all of these realms, if not in an explicit way, in on a heart level. And, and that took a while for me to see. Let me encourage you. I remember coming to faith as well going, I don't, don't have a ton of sin, but I'm really compelled by the story of Jesus and God's forgiveness. Guess when my awareness of sin came? <laughs> in the years to come, as I became more familiar with God's standard and the scriptures. And you know what the scriptures are for? They are not there to save us. God's commandments are not there to save us from our sin. They cannot save us, right? Um, the, the to do's and the, the don't do's cannot save us from our sin. Um, because, I mean, kind of one way to, to look at this as well, the, um, uh, why it is not, here, here we go, actually we'll, we'll shift to, to Romans 3, um, where Paul, Paul basically pieces together passages, mostly Psalms, and in, in furthering his arguments. And there's those four angles that he looks at. Both Jews and Greeks are under sin, as is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All are turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Um, a really kind of legit question valid question that, that arises when we, we look seriously at this doctrine is, and we've actually had debates in ACFA, some student leaders have represented the can't really be good without God and others, you know, the you know, atheist, agnostics, humanist, the, the club were arguing that you can't be good without God. Well, what's the, here's my, my, my take there. Um, what's the definition of good? first of all, and, and what's our motive for doing good? And, and the Christian will argue, the Christian will argue that our motive for everything is to glorify God. So if that fundamental baseline kind of reality, my life is to glorify God, uh, is missing, then um, I cannot truly be good by God's definition because I'm missing the most fundamental Kind of thing. There's another. Uh, there's another problem. I think when we think of a, a works kind of salvation, a works based salvation, like can I somehow overcome the sin that I have by doing good things? It's a. It's a really basic, incredibly important question when we consider Christianity or other faith systems. Can you be good enough? Maybe I'm starting, I got half of the Ten Commandments done. So is that going to be good enough? Here's the problem with that. And, and again, it's just, I think it's simple logic. If I sin against Tyler and, and offend him in some way, a significant way, right? Not a, not a small thing, but a significant wound, and, and there's damage done. And I go, maybe I feel a little guilty, my heart isn't super hard. And so over here, I go, well, I'm going to do something different, Ashton, then. I'm going to. You know, bless him in some way. I'm gonna, um, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever. Some some good deed, right, for Ashton. Have I fixed the problem with Tyler? It's obviously not. There's there's a <laughs> <laughs> um, justice demands that that be repaired. Uh, something, you know, restored, forgiveness, uh, or, or apology. Um, 
reparations, whatever it might be, that needs to be dealt with. My little good deed over here does not deal with that, okay? That's just simply how it works before God. It's like, I have this boatload now at my age of sin, and, and yes, I have done some good things. By God's grace, I've been, you know, worked on the good things for it. That is not enough to offset what I've done. Somebody has to pay for those sins, right? And make those right. And so we're going to get to that um, in a moment. Second stop in, in Romans verse 4 here, Romans 3. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. Then he pastes another one in there. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Here's, here's a litmus test, right? If you want to know what condition your heart is in, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When I began to see cynical, which is, uh, I think, kind of bitterness and unbelief, the bitterness plus unbelief, cynical, if I start to see that, uh, that's a flag for me now. If I begin to see um, sarcasm, another one of my old favorites, that's, that's bitterness and arrogance, right? Uh, another flag. It's like that's an overflow of the condition of my heart. So we're going to talk in a, in a moment about, as believers, this back and forth that we face. But we, as unbelievers, we're, we're just back. Right? We're in, in trouble, and, and so we want to get to that. Third stop. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are in misery, and the way of peace they have not known. If we uh, reject uh, Jesus, and if we set our minds on, on an independent course, chart our own way, I can guarantee that our lives will be littered with broken relationships. And I've seen this play out so many times. We will be increasing the odds that we will have a trail of broken relationships behind us dramatically if we do not um, put to death by God's grace this, this uh, the sin that is residing inside of our hearts. It just is going to happen. Marriage, I mentioned still standing in 25 years, is incredibly challenging to live with somebody for 25 years and, and to see everything and, um, and, and to be known on that level. Um, only by God's grace um, can we keep from really hurting each other because that's what evil hearts do. Um, last thing that, that uh, Paul highlights, there's no fear of God before their eyes. And that basically means a uh, there is no acknowledgement um, that, that God is God. There is no credit given to a God who endowed me with the ability to wiggle my ears. There is, I mean, I'm just kind of going, living in my own way and thinking somehow, not good math, that I am somehow deserve the credit responsible for um, blessings or gifts that, that God gave me with. There's a, there's a dismissing a dismissive kind of attitude. Um, God is not a part of the picture, nor is there a desire for God to be a part of the picture. And, and we certainly don't fear answering to God. That's the, the state or the condition of a, of a, of a heart that is fallen and, and is, has this bent, this kind of fatal bent uh, towards evil. Okay, let's... Um, so this passage, and then we will I'll reflect on a couple of things. Um, notice how often the word love appears in this short passage. This is from Paul also. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Um, and that's a, a phrase that, that represents the, the church age or maybe the end of the church age. This time, this effort. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Um, a terrible uh, passage, but, but a passage that captures well the reality, the truth that we are passion-driven, 
desire-driven creatures. We love what we love. We make space for anything that we love. We pursue what we love. We go after with all that we have, anything that we desire and love. Paul distinguishes, though, between a, a, a love that is, is created, uh, created things or, or creature-based and one that, that starts vertical. The definition of idolatry is exactly that. That our passions, instead of being directed first to God, as, as the great commandment says they should be, are instead directed to created things, to money. Uh, and there's a, a, it's a form of idolatry, right? We can become addicted to going after with all that we have these earthly things and we neglect the, the vertical. Um, the, the most extreme, one of the extreme examples I saw this was, was actually really helpful because it was honest. It was in the, in the hometown or in Northampton. There was a, a weekly, a piece in the newspaper, right? The, the local religious folks would, would share, they do an essay on them and there'd be photos and, and all that. So one of the, one week there was a woman who turned her home into a shrine to a goddess. And it had all uh, kinds of religious kind of artifacts and, and features and, and a name of the goddess. And I'm like, as I, I read all the characteristics, the character qualities of the goddess that she created and, and worshiped in her home, I'm like, wait a minute, that probably looks a lot like her. <laughs> One of the, an, a, we can either kind of worship created things and, and, and submit to them, or we want to elevate ourselves and worship ourselves, essentially. Very incredibly dangerous. Um, and so our, our, our quest, right, as, a, as sincere seekers of God is like, who is God? And, and how has he revealed himself? And, and making adjustments accordingly when what we learn about God is not squaring away with maybe what we would desire or what we could imagine or our own small take on the world at, at any given moment. So beware of those things. All right, we'll get to that in just a moment. A couple of reflections, um, and I will try to move this a little faster. But three parts to these reflections, and I promise I will be brief, but they're in line with the greatest commandments, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to love your neighbor as yourself, okay? So in, in recalibrating and reorienting, we need to recognize that sin is believing the lie that we are self-made, independent, and self-sustained. That's the, the heart of sin. It's, it's a uh, dismissive, again, kind of perspective. It's idolatry. Um, and here's a, a second point I, I want to just, as I think about this, is, um, The beauty of aligning ourselves with the gospel and, and determined, right, to love God first. Here's the beauty of that. When things go wrong in this earth, when relationships fail, uh, struggles in marriage, struggles in the workplace, struggles with colleagues, uh, breakdowns with friends, injustice, powers, you know, much greater than, than us colliding with our small lives. When injustice happens, there may or may not be justice on this earth. And I believe as, as believers, as Christians, we, we, we need to value justice as much as God does and to pursue it when we can. And some of you are going to make a difference in that realm. And you're in the, the spectrum of God's justice and mercy as he reveals himself. You're kind of justice leaning. You might make a difference in this world and change some things, right? I hope you do. And praise God, but I, I, I know this, that justice will never be complete and not even close in this lifetime in light of the fact that sin is so prevalent. And, and it's just, it's everywhere. The damage is endless. Here's, here's a small solace, at least in this moment, is that God is just and he sees it all. There will be a day when everyone will be 
brought into uh, account of the poor God. I was just reading about the man who lost a daughter and murdered him, and, and his solace, right, was that even though that person had never been identified or apprehended, that God knew who that person was and that they would stand before God and justice would be done on them. Um, second, as we love our neighbor, let me just say this about, um, uh, here, here's a great Spurgeon quote. We cannot love um, people that we are afraid of. We cannot love people that we're afraid of. So if we love people, it means that we're willing to really love them like God does. It means that we might need to entertain the idea that my friend who doesn't know the Lord is on a destructive path. And who else is going to be there and intervene for him? Who else is going to be there to maybe say the hard thing in my attempts to befriend and to and share the gospel? Um, if this verdict is true, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, then I am so on task to, uh, and, and in obedience to Jesus, to share the gospel liberally, because the gospel is the answer. And we're going to finish with that in a moment. Um, the second thing is in our expectations, and this is so helpful. Expectations are everything in life. Expectations in your marriage, in the workplace, whatever, right? Because we need to dial down probably our expectations a little bit. I need to give lots of space for my friends and my colleagues and family members to fall short and to sometimes fall flat on their face and to sometimes do some damage. I need to give some space and grace there and, and because that's exactly what's going to happen. And I hope that they're gracious to me when I fall flat on my face. We need to, it's so helpful in this life to dial our expectations down a little bit. Again, not to, in, you know, uh, enable, not to, um, you know, uh, pretend and cover. And no, we need to, you know, call a spade a spade and, and really deal with transgression and, and those types of things. But man, do, after a while, you're like, nothing surprises you anymore. Nothing surprises you that that another human being could actually do certain things. Why? Because we're starting to see it's like, I could do those things. Very helpful in, in kind of helping us to, to climb down off of the any judgment seats that we climb on to. Last, love ourselves um, uh, real fast. Um, seeing Sin and, and recognizing that we fall short of God's standards is, is kind of, it's tough to see. Um, but God uh, has given us a way to move forward. And that way is to, to be decisive in turning away from these habits and, and bad patterns and sins, right? But also just to confess on a regular basis. I confess sins on an almost daily basis, I think, probably. I'm aware enough now of these things, self-aware, I can see pretty quickly what's going on inside of my heart at this point in my life. I confess things on a regular basis because there's a battle that still is going on inside. Um, and then the other thing, that this is this is gold and it's the heart of the gospel. Um, we have a responsibility before God to forgive everybody for everything. And that might be one of the most challenging uh, things that Jesus said. Um, top two, um, to forgive everybody for everything. That's worth another talk or, you know, just uh, working in it. If you feel stuck in unforgiveness or if there's a, you, you detect some bitterness inside your soul, please take that very seriously. Take that very seriously. That's a serious spiritual problem. And, and the Lord is, um, is aware of it. And the Lord is able to meet us in our bitterness or in that unforgiveness and to give us the strength. You know, it's funny, it's because we're not really forgiving someone for their sake. In some ways, maybe, if, especially if there's still a relationship. There's some reality there. We're forgiving them for our sake, fundamentally. We need to be, to be clean, and a bitter heart is, leads to, to terrible things. Okay, let's, um, let's uh, familiar verse, but check this out. We'll, we'll 
we'll read two and I need to wrap up here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because it works for evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in my God. If you detect resistance in you to, to draw close to God or to let the light of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit shine, um, again, recognize where that's coming from. We, we have that disposition, right? So, so recognize it and stare down and, and reject it and, and turn to the Lord uh, because he is gracious and he can set us free. Last passage, and look at the end of Romans. And this is in the um, How to Live section. And, um, after starting with, with a horrible doctrine in, in Romans, Paul is finishing like this. But notice how it's woven in throughout this entire passage. But love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another, joy and honor. Do not be slothful and zeal, but be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Incredible that the theme of his instructions is fundamentally what to do in a fallen world and how to live, and how to live in a, a, a holy and a righteous way when there's so much dark, sad, devastating you know, kinds of activity all around us. It's to live like that. And that's the, the difference. And here's, here's another thing, please, you're good students, you're great students. Keep it, just watch, look carefully, be a good observer of, of all the human activity around you. And, and most of all, keep close watch on what's going on inside of your heart. You know, I, I care about what's going on around me and people I, I love and things that are going on. and, and, and I, Concerned on some level, I'm engaged. But you know who I'm most concerned with in this lifetime? Right here. I, I, I want to stay clean. I want my heart to be clean. Um, I want to be confessed up. I don't want any bitterness here. I want to be a vessel of God's grace and life and hope in a really dark world. There's a, one of the pieces I'll share is up on Mother Teresa's, one of her homes in the that is written by another guy, I'll, I'll share it with you. But the gist of it was, um, people can, this is paraphrase, people can, can be kind of nasty and ungrateful, love them anyway. Um, that's the uh, kind of the heart, I think, of uh, an outcome as we kind of wrestle with these things. I don't think we have time to break into small groups unless I happily would be overruled. I don't know, it's up to, Oh, I'm sorry if you have. Yeah. Want to break that? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, you're already kind of spaced out. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, <laughs> you actually stayed awake, which I really appreciate on a Friday night. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, break into groups within the, the seats here of like five inch or so.
four or five, something like that. It might require you to travel a little bit. And what I would love to do is create a little bit of space for people to reflect on this together. Uh, I am, I'm going to say it's a free skate in that feel free to, um, if, if anything stood out to you, why uh, you have a comment or a thought, you disagree with something, or you're not sure about what you say. I mean, anything like that would be is fair game. And I think we're going to go for about 10 minutes. So let's break out really fast, and, and we'll call you back in about 10. Thanks, everyone.